Okay, now you can go. Talk about a hard act to follow. Um, I've been down over here, now I'm up here, believe it or not, uh, this is the first presentation I made in the, seven, uh, the seventh uh, edition of uh, the Arkansas Singer Symposium. It took me seven, seven tries to get up here and get my paper approved. So um, uh, I'm Don Caps. Uh, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of this, uh, and one of the people that uh, gives credit to everybody else. You guys are all making it happen. Uh, I wanted to talk about something I came across as a historian of motorsport. Vacuums to historians are like catnip. When your ignorance and your lack of knowledge about a topic becomes evident, you just find yourself into that void. You start looking. Uh, I knew a lot about uh, Formula One, Grand Prix, sports car sort of thing. Uh, having grown up in Europe, having got that interest, uh, I had friends. Uh, uh, Paul Sheldon, who was uh, one of the, the co-founders of the Formula One Register, was a dear friend of mine. They created the record of Vort uh, Grand Prix Vorturet racing, and it was very interesting. We had a lot of correspondence, and in one of our exchanges, he says, you know, I love sprint car racing. I love American racing. And I was stunned because here's the person who is the expert. All that information you see out there on the internet about results from Formula One racing, it was taken from their, their research. So I said, okay. He said, Don, I want you to think seriously about looking into American racing. And I said, okay, so how do I do this? I'm really not that familiar with American racing, per se, and what's available. Well, 20-something years later, about 25 years later, here I am trying to give you some idea. When I started looking into this, I started focusing on the early years, up to about 1920, because that was an area that I found a big void. And I started digging and digging and digging. And the more I started digging, the more I found. The more I found, the more I started looking elsewhere. And one of the things that became evident to me over time was there is basically, whoops, here we go. Is this thing working? Not working. Ah, there we go. I put a hex on all this technology, as sorry as anything. One of the things I found is just like you'll find in many cases in history, there is a market, there is this incredible um, glut of books, articles about year things change. It's, you know, 1948, 1944, 1816. And, and it kind of occurred to me as I was doing my research that there was a year that kept kind of popping up as I looked through all this material that I had been collecting and been researching and looking into. And the year ended up being 1908, which is not the year I would have anticipated once I took that step back as a historian and started looking at the context and the objectivity of where is this, where are some dividing points? And I kept coming back, looking at it, and it came back always to 1908. Well, why 1908? Here are just a few of the things that happened in 1908 in American racing. The appearance of road racing, there had been the uh, uh, the William K. Uh, Vanderbilt uh, Junior Cup, but that was it. 
The New York to Paris event <coughs> took place. The New York State Automotive Association changes its dues assessed. We're going to come to that, which meant that the American, uh, the Automobile Club of America withdrew from the American Automobile Association. The uh, international organization, uh, which is now the FIA, the AICA, or back in those days, sided with the Automobile Club of America, not the AAA in this dispute. We'll come to that. Then there was agreement. The Vanderbilt Cup was held out on uh, uh, Long Island, and of course it was the locomobile that won. Uh, number 16, a very, you know, George Robertson and all that. They had the first race in Savannah, and I can say right now I'm one of the probably few people in the world that has flown the old route in an OH-58 Kiowa. Uh, boys and their toys sort of deals when I was at Fort Stewart. And it was also one of the places that comes back to this coming together. It was one of the first seasons that season reviews, the first year that season reviews began to appear. And there was an, uh, the Motor Contest Association, which nobody's ever heard of probably, uh, starts to contact the AAA. So it comes down to three things. The road racing arrives in the United States, the schism between the, the ACA and the AAA, and the appearance of season reviews. These are the things that kind of coalesced uh, in my thinking when I looked at it. Well, first one, of course, is obvious, road racing. In January 1909, in Motor Age, this is the first review of American road racing that's been published. Take my word for it. If you can find an early one, good for you. I have looked everywhere. And it was written by a guy, C.G. Chris Sensabaugh. And if you see on the right side, that is a listing of all the road races in the United States that year. The number of the year before, zero. There was no Vanderbilt Cup in 1907. And here you have this incredible list. In some races, you, uh, it's kind of amazing. Mount Baldy race in Los Angeles. There was a race... Uh, a very interesting race from Jacksonville to Miami. Just a number of things. All the the, uh, the, uh, the races uh, uh, in Savannah. So this is a big deal. Suddenly we go from no road racing in 1908. Suddenly we have a glut. We've got 21 separate road races out of nowhere. That's a big change because again, suddenly road racing is a big deal. Motor age and the automobile, uh, horseless age, now they're big deals. They take front page of an issue. So that's a change. Of course, where does that lead us? In American racing, uh, there was after 1916, 1920, well actually 1920, the last Elgin race. Not until 1933 did you have another road race of any consequence. That was at Elgin for stock cars. And then you had the mine field race. How many of you flown into LAX? If you have, that's mine field, right on that location. That was 1934. And of course in 36 and 37, you have the, the George Vanderbilt Cup races that happened. So 1908 is when road racing really becomes an American thing. And amazingly enough, in 1948, we have the race here at Watkins Glen, the Watkins Glen Grand Prix, which leads us to like Riverside, the first uh, Grand Prix for sports cars. Uh, that's a big little bit of uh, PR sort of thing. And of course, then the race here, I picked uh, the 1961 race, mostly because I was here for that one. The second thing that really got me, because I'm into digging into conflicts inside racing, I love that sort of thing, because it kills you a lot. The schism between the uh, Automobile Club of America and the AAA, it was a big story. Uh, there's an article uh, starting from the left, that's from the uh, the New York Times, there's a war going on, a uh, publication called Motor, talks about ACA versus AAA, then Motor World, another publication. 
I was very confused about this whole thing because I didn't know a lot about the Automobile Club of America. Found it was organized in 1899. Its first racing rules were published in 1901. And despite being told by numerous people they didn't exist, I found them. They were an original member of the AAA. In fact, they were one of the organizing clubs, of the seven clubs that organized it in 1902. One of the problems with the ACA was not long after the AAA was formed, when there was a transition going on about the racing, on Staten Island there was speed trials, and there was an F, the uh, torpedo, the Baker torpedo, ran off the race after establishing a, a the point, uh, a speed, almost a speed record for uh, one kilometer, went into the crowd, killed several people, injured others, and the organizing that club uh, was, the promoter was the Automobile Club of America. So they were on a line for liabilities. They passed several um, uh, uh, you know, they looked at this whole thing and said, we're not going to do road racing. We're not going to do anything on public roads. Which meant that in 1904, when you had the first Vanderbilt Cup, that's why AAA, not the Automobile Club of America, was the sanctioning body. Because they had passed resolutions saying, we're not going to do anything that involves public roads. The only thing we'll do is like maybe reliability trials and so forth which is interesting because it was an international event, and in May of 1904, the uh, ACA became a member of the uh, Automobile Clubs International, you know, the International Organization of Recognized Automobile Clubs, what is in English, what is now the FIA, was established in Germany. They were the official American member. They were uh, recognized as the official American Automobile Club. In 1908, the ACA resigned from the New York Auto State Automobile uh, Association. I could never figure out how ACA got into racing in 1908 until this came up. And it had nothing to do with racing. It was a dues change. There was, had been a cap of $500 per club. And then the uh, New York State uh, Automobile Association said, no, we're going to do it per member. Well, the ACA had about 1,200 members, which meant that their dues more than increased by, you know, doubled. So they got angry about that, had a falling out. Uh, they fell out with the ACA, uh, with the uh, AAA. ACA went its own way. The agreement with the American uh, Automobile Association, later on I'll talk about that, was who was going to be the international representative of the United States and who was going to be the national club for racing within the United States. That's what that's all about. The ACA finally came back into the AAA in the 1920s, something I was not aware of. Again, my ignorance is only exceeded by my lack of knowledge of this topic for the most part until I started digging into this. The American Automobile Association, still around, still around. Organized in 1902, as I said, the racing board was one of the original committees. The first thing racing rules were uh, issued in 1903. I was told they didn't exist, yet I found them. Uh, the Vanderbilt Cup, they were the sanctioning uh, club for that. They actually held the first national championship, the National Motor Car Championship in 1905 in Barney Oldfield, was the winner of that championship. But it kind of vanished into thin air. In 1907, there was no Vanderbilt Cup. The falling out over racing, because the international, AIACR, uh, sided with the Automobile Club of America. An agreement was made, just like I just told you, the Automobile Club of America would be the international organization for racing, et cetera. The AAA would do national racing, things within the United States. So they had that. The Motor Contest Association, which was made of the uh, manufacturers, 
was, came to the AAA in late 1908, early 1909, a result of this agreement to have the a, AAA be the sanctioning body officially and be funded, and that happened in 1909. The AAA, and you see the dates, 1916, 1920 to 1941, and again from 1946 to 1955, had national championships. The, uh, a, uh, a, the ACA was replaced at the uh, AICR uh, by the AAA in 1928, particularly on the SCA, the International Sporting Committee. And then in the end of 1955, the AAA leaves racing. So that is a canned idea, something that a time frame and some explanation I was, had no idea about. I'd never read it anywhere. And for a racing historian, it was a little bit of embarrassing. One of the reasons I find myself found myself going back to 1908 because it sets up this whole series of conflicts when you start going back to the roots. American, if American racing organizations aren't fighting, they're not doing anything. You go back to AAA versus IMCA. You go back to AAA versus NASCAR. You can USAC versus NASCAR. USAC versus SACA. USAC versus CART. CART versus IRL. IRL versus so you get an idea, and I realize it's, I look back at things, this all seems to roll back to 1908 in that conflict with ACA. Again, catnip for historians, this kind of sort of explaining things to me. Now the last thing, the third thing that got me was season reviews. Prior to the end of the 1908 season, all the publications, whether it's Motor World, Motor Age, Horseless Age, the Automobile, whatever, did not do season reviews. But within a week of each other, in the late end of December uh, 1908 and in the first week of January 1909, you find these two season reviews being published independently. That is a remarkable change because what happens is they become an annual affair. And I want you to notice, the one in uh, Motor Age, the one on the right, that appeared in Motor Age. In Motor Age the next year, as a result of doing the season and reviews, says, oh yeah, we're going to name a champion driver, which just happens to be Bert Dingley. Next year, they, and next year and next year, they named the champion, champion road racing driver. That's something that I did not catch at first, champion road racing driver. Uh, and what's kind of interesting is in 1911, it's a, a person that most of you probably never heard of. I hadn't. And that's uh, Harvey Herrick, champion road racing of the United States. Ring a bell? California guy. Again, of course, the 1914 is a very uh, obvious one, and that's Ralph De Palma. So that starts to, so, so this is something that I go back again to 1908. This continues this idea of racing champion. It, it, it gets a little more complicated. By 1915, it's gotten really complicated. Uh, on, on the left side of the screen, it's the uh, Racing Champions 1915. That's in the horseless age. And you, inside, you'll see in those little box, they looked at road racing and they looked at track racing. And they came up with a champion, it was Earl Cooper. Then in motor age, did road racing and speedway racing and track racing. They had three different set, uh, sets of championships in one year, three different issues. And then uh, in motor, they had not only road racing, uh, again, that was uh, Earl Cooper and the Stutz, but they also had track racing. So you now have all these champions being named by periodicals. In 1916, however, AAA now has an official national championship. Bang, there it is. And, of course, it's uh, you know, Daryl Resta in his Peugeot. But 
1917 to 1919, there was no national champion. In 1920, they created it again. It was, uh, but in 1954, Russ uh, Catlin starts publishing a history of national championship racing. And uh, this is in December 1954. And he says, Robinson or Dingley, he creates a, uh, he looks at one set of uh, facts that have been in the file. He says, yeah, there might be a question. And what happens is all those champions that were being named by motor age, postless age, the automobile, well, suddenly they become official champions later on. Now, that has a lot as a historian. Uh, and I think, Rob, you just found out, around here, if you say something, you're going to get corrected by Bill Green or someone. <laughs> I mean, that, that is the nature of historians. Uh, again, I, except for some people like Tom and a few others who really had looked into this, I found myself in the wilderness doing this topic because hardly anybody had looked at it as an academic, if you will. I had gone into the archives, uh, various places, gone through all these uh, journals. Uh, your, your eyes fall out after a while, trying to sort fact from fiction, particularly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when all this kind of gets altered around. People who were never champions are, never cha are now cha national champions. Which brings me to IndyCar. My last little word here. Uh, the um, trophy that they give out for the Astro Cup, Challenge Cup, they have a base it sits on. On that base, it has all the national champions. The problem is, and this is where the historian in me just goes berserk, is the fact that it's wrong. You know, we get up and jump up and down and go, it's wrong, we can't stand it. Uh, again, historians, you ask what time it is, we'll give you a history of how time was formed and how it was created. Talk about handheld calculator, we'll tell you all about calculation and how we got to calculators. This bothers me to no end. I have fought with uh, IndyCar now for several years uh, to get this corrected, and it's like, thank you, we hear you, have a nice life, don't call us, we're going to call you again. But if you, you can't see it very well, but it starts off with 1909 and George Robinson. What bothers me is in 1920, there were five races, the champion that was crowned that year was a posthumous uh, champion, Gaston Chevrolet, who died in the, at Los Angeles uh, on, on Thanksgiving Day. He had enough points to be the champion, not by much, but enough. Later, for some reason, some people with time on their hands went back and looked at some other races, added them in, and suddenly it's Tommy Milton. And I found out when I started looking at this controversy, uh, there's a wonderful person who's no longer with us, unfortunately, he died of, uh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, um, John Glenn Prince. I uh, got to know John very, very well. And this bothered him, and it bothered me. We, we, there was an exchange in uh, IndyCar Racing Magazine, as a matter of fact, uh, with Bob Baruso. As a historian, we love, believe in, live and die by footnotes in our research. Everything, and I think, you know, I looked at led me to believe, uh, Tommy Milton I have great admiration for, wonderful driver, one of the best. He deserved the championship in 1921. But it was Aston Chevrolet. Yet IndyCar most often will, they say one thing, but when you look at what they have on their website, for instance, it still leads you to believe it's Tommy Milton. And that was part of how I got back to 1908. See how historians work? We had that, I never dreamed that that one year could be so influential, but the rise of the road racing, 
that schism between the organizations, and again, this whole idea of something as innocuous as those season reviews. All that kind of comes together. And again, it makes my heart really sore when we have people out there who say, yeah, I'm trying, I think I can start tracking on this. Now, give credit where credit's due. It had not been for the International Motor Racing Research Center, a lot of what I have just talked to you about would not have been possible. Resources here, contacts made through here, open doors, made things happen. So that's one of the reasons this is important to have this type of exchange. This is why we exist. This is what it's all about. This is my little donation to this ocean of knowledge, my two little drops in there. This is why we formed this. Mike Arkensinger and I talked about this for ages. Then, fortunately, Mike went, passed away. Pat Young, Dr. Pat Young, per, uh, uh, Professor Emeritus of Literature at the University of Houston, along with uh, myself and, and, and a great crew, uh, put together this initial one. We only had three people, and this is the sort of thing I wanted to get talked about. You know, Rob talks about getting emotional about being on the track. I get emotional about it when it talks about this is one of the places that we was created by Gene Argan Singer so that people like me and other people here could come together, do research, share our findings, and make things happen. So thank you for the patience. Uh, uh, for, and if there's any questions, forget it. I'm not going to answer. No. Uh, <laughs> but, but quite seriously, thank you. Uh, um, this is um, a work of love, not just this presentation, but what you guys are doing uh, and so forth. So any, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I, I, um, um, the, I think what happened in 08 was there were a lot of European cars that came over here, and they had to have a place to run them. I think that was one of it. Yeah. And you're absolutely right on that Vanderbilt Cup, that, that thing. That they, and that's one of the things that the Speedway Museum has pointed out to those guys, that Tommy Milton was everybody's fan favorite, but you know, he drove the Duesenbergs, and he was a kind of a fair-haired boy, but Gaston Chevrolet was the guy that won it. We've told them about that. So that's kind of interesting. Also, I want to say that the Speedway Museum has all of the AAA records. I know. All of the AAA records, and they're available for anybody to come and take a look at. So, uh, but I think what happened in 08 was, the, was a fact. You had a lot of European cars that were running around, and they came over, Mercedes especially. You, you, what you got was a sanitized, you got the 30 minute version of the eight hour lecture. Because you're absolutely correct. The appearance of European cars, but particularly from about 04, 03, 04, up until right at the end of the beginning of the 20s, into, well, in the 20s, that had a lot to do with this creation. Again, I had to pack a lot down, but you hit it spot on. The number of a European uh, automobiles on the track, not just on the road courses, but on the tracks themselves, meant that at some point, particularly in 06, 07, that there was going to be some transition of a point where this all came up. And I, I would have mentioned, if, but I will now, uh, had not been for those files that I got access to thank you, you know, IMRCA, CI, that I got access because of the connections we made here to those files. I had uh, the microfilm uh, copies that were made uh, by Gordon White, thank, the, the, with courtesy of the, uh, the museum, those things. That was a revelation. You're absolutely correct. That changed everything for me. That really added, uh, substance and context to all those little things that weren't making sense. 
And that was one of the, I think that was why this is all catnip. None of this was making sense. But as you correctly pointed out, there was this, there was this. All these things came together. And like I said, 1908 just happened to be the year that I saw this sort of synergy begin to shift things. Because if you look from 1907 back, then you look at 08 forward, there is a definite change. There really is a definite change in American rate. You have to take a long view, but that really is a turning point. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I will. I'll go back to my microphone. <laughs>